what strikes me in your book is that you're talking to a lot of people that supported the boys before they were so famous. And the thing that hits me at the end of the book is that all these people that were pushing them forward, they suddenly left behind. Well, I think that they locked, they closed the door. Shelley, there's no question about it. When they closed the door, they locked it tight. Uh, I'm not suggesting in any way that they forgot about those people, but life goes on. They have their own families, they have their own situations. But I do believe that history, not necessarily the guys, but history has forgotten a lot of these people. People like Bill Harry, people like Sam Leach, uh, people like even Alan Williams, who was a bit of an opportunist in the beginning. Uh, people uh, like uh, Frida, Frida Kelly, who uh, made this wonderful movie, and finally they realized they had to give her a hand and get her some music for it, you know? I think that these are people who were very quiet, didn't go about, you know, promoting themselves. They didn't really care about that. All they really wanted to do was to make them successful. And there's no question in my mind that there are no regrets. I mean, if you look at Bill Harry and his wife, they're having some, you know, difficulties later in life, with medical issues, things like that. But they're still in love with each other. They have a great son. They are very proud. Uh, the problem is that Bill Harry, as we say in America, can't get arrested in Britain for his knowledge. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, Alan Williams is a bit of a character. Sam Leach, I think, is, is just a fascinating, charming man. Like, you know, there's a movie being made about him now, and uh, the friends of his are making a movie. And the most, the most interesting part of it all, to me, is that all these people get together and they talk and they have their own society and their own fraternities. Uh, so I like that. I also like the fact that uh, Pete Best is finally being recognized, uh, not necessarily as the man who pushed the Beatles to success, but who played a role in it. There's no question about it. I mean, he, he was kicked out of the band one year and a half before I met them for the first time. Right. And so, you know, all these people and the people that cared about Paul, his family, uh, the people, at Litherland Town Hall, the young promoters I mentioned, many of them are still around. Sir Ron Watson is probably a person you never heard of, who was a law clerk and, and saw them at the, at the cavern 400 times. And a person who will say to you today, the band was better with Pete in it. It's just his oh, opinion. Right. And he yeah. used to plunk down 20 cents and get his hot dog or whatever the hell else they served there, Coca-Cola. Yeah. Uh, these are people, and, and, and uh, uh, Ron Ellis, who is somebody nobody in America knows. Ron is a guy who uh, is a soccer writer and a Beatles biographer of sorts who bought them their records. He brought them their 45 records to listen from the boats. He would go down to the dock and get the music for them. Mm -hmm. And he loves them. He loves talking about them. He can tell you stories about meeting them in the locker rooms. And so all these people all have a society that gets together. They take care of each other. They remember their birthdays when Alan Williams turned 80 a couple of years ago. Who threw the party? Frida Kelly. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. So how did you decide to do this book? You've written Ticket to Ride about their, their tours that you were a part of. Then you did Lennon Revealed, which identified John Lennon as a man. And you went into that. This book is so different. And I wonder what made you want to write about that time period? Well, I didn't know. Uh, first of all, I didn't necessarily want to write around that time period, about that time period. I wanted to write how they got to where they, I finally met them. Okay. So really a lot of it is the last year and a half. But I, I really, one of the things I found out about the Beatles is that all the history in the beginning was the way they wanted it. So when you're interested in news or history, you really want to do real, what really happened the real story. Right. And the, for example, the anthology was a wonderful piece of work. Uh, the video was great. I played a part of that. The audio was great. The, uh, the, 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 the book was great. But the fact is, it was their version of events. Right. It's sort of like Barack Obama or Bill Clinton or George Bush writing their own story yeah. without anybody challenging it. Now, I'm not saying there's anything to challenge. This is all a good news story. Great music, great band, great history. But it would be nice, it's nice to know, I think, from a standpoint of history, who did what, when, and where, and what happened, what really happened, 
when Pete Best told Neil Aspinall, stay with this band. Mm -hmm. Do not mm -hmm. leave this band. Yeah. They're going to be big. And Neil said, no, I'm doing it because I'm not going to allow you to be uh, tortured this way. I think that's pretty extraordinary and unselfish of the part of people. If you know you have a best friend and you're working in the same company, and the person quits, you want to sympathize with them. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, you know, Pete wanted him to be successful. And, and by the way, there's an other interesting fact that I find that's fascinating. Pete Best was kicked out of the band 52 years ago. A couple of years ago, Neil Aspinall died. Mm -hmm. And I know that John, I mean that Paul, and uh, Ringo paid their respects, but they did not go to the funeral. Now, who was at the funeral? Paul's family was there, okay? His whole family. Yoko was there. Olivia Harrison was there. And, uh, and Barbara Bach was there. Okay, they all came, because this is Neil Aspinall. This is the guy who right. ran their empire for decades. But Paul and Ringo did not attend, it's a private service did not attend it. Who else was at this funeral? Pete Best and his entire family. And Roe, his brother, who is Neil's son. Yes. So, I mean, I think when you when you think about that, uh, it kind of, it's not suspicious, it's just kind of odd that they haven't seen Pete in all those years. Yeah. They've never seen him. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, I'm not putting them down. They have their own lives. Certainly Paul has had his own aggravations and people have their own ways of doing things. But uh, it was kind of odd. Do you think that there's some uh, leftover animosity? Do you think that that was why they didn't want to go? Or do you think they were embarrassed? Or why would you? I don't why think they're you? embarrassed at all. I think that, number one, they probably didn't want to make a fuss over their friend's funeral. Number two, um, I think they may have been uncomfortable about seeing Peter. Yeah. And you know something, 52 years is a long time. To be uncomfortable. You have divorced <laughs> fa parents who go to funerals. You have people who used to be married to people who go to funerals. I'm not suggesting they paid any disrespect. What I am saying is it's a little odd. I mean, yeah. you know, how about, hey, Pete, how you doing? How are right. your grandchildren? Right. You know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not putting them down. And, yeah. I, and I don't think this, certainly, believe me, the people I've met in my life and I've covered four Beatles, or as good, pure, as quality human beings you'll ever find. Right. We were talking earlier about your... Go. Go ahead, you, you, you. I can edit. Go ahead. Can edit. How are you? Yeah. Uh, about Julia Baird and your conversations with her. Tell me love, a little bit about I your interview. I love meeting her. I felt, first of all, she has John's face, and she has his eyes, and she has that sort of Lennon intensity. Uh, there's, there's a little bit, I don't mean to put Julia down for this, but there's a little bit of uh, emotional trauma in the, in the Lennon eyes, okay? And I mean that in a nice way. Uh, but she was so nervous about, she thought I was going to uh, tow the company line that, uh, her mom was a bad person, and actually I found out a lot about her mom from her, mm -hmm. and I would have liked to have known both her and Mimi, but I never did, mm -hmm. And I, because I think that obviously it's a great dynamic in that family. Right. And uh, the dynamic was, uh, as Mimi was ru allegedly running through the bombs, which apparently weren't falling, and she was going to the hospital where John was born, she was telling everybody, this is the one I've been waiting for. Well, she never had her own child. Yeah. And obviously she felt very close to him. I think that in a way her stewardship of his life was not bad at all. It just okay. was very strict and disciplinary. And I think that, uh, I don't think you could be strict or disciplinary with John Lennon and get away with it. Uh, <laughs> and he probably needed some of it anyway, right? I think so. I mean, he's a volatile guy. <laughs> Very fiery guy. I mean, here's a guy Handful. who who spent the mornings trying to figure out how to torment his teachers. <laughs> All right. He was, you know, uh, Stu Sutcliffe's sister, uh, Pauline. Pauline, constantly talks about the fact that John was an anarchist. And she's right. He wanted to disrupt life. And look what he did. He took all that energy and channeled it into music. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, sure.